Greetings, folks. Hi, any military historians out there, general historians, war to history buffs, war gamers, and any other enthusiasts about knowledge. Welcome back to another Let's Play video. We're continuing our Eurofront series in the month of October. I actually already have the log file set up. What I could set up is probably the email, right? So that's that's probably what y'all you you want to see. So, one moment here and get that set up. I said email. I meant to say rule book. So, I played the log file a moment ago, uh, but I actually I had problems with the audio recording. So, I'm going to go ahead and start the file and just go ahead, do the log file, show y'all what happened in the month of October. Let's dive in. So uh, first things first, we're going to start with Soviet production. So I'm going to switch to the Soviet side for that. And the general idea is strategically, you know, we can look at the Soviet uh, Stavka, the Soviet high command. They're at level zero right now. So we really have no supreme moves. Uh, we don't really have that many available, right? It's going to take a while before this is built up to full strength. How did it get down to zero so quickly? Even now, it's kind of hard to say. Clearly, we spent it. But, I mean, remarkable to think that we had to spend it so much in the last few turns just to prevent a total collapse of our defense here in the Caucasus mountain range, Caucasus. And this turn basically was focused on building up all our units here, trying to build them up as strong as possible to establish a new defensive line as the German army is making steady progress, right? They they broke through in the last month, this region near Twops, right? These uh, Caucasus mountain ranges. And so the road to Batumi uh, is now wide open. So, you know, losing Batumi is going to be a big problem for the Soviets. It's going to create a giant Axis lake, pretty much all but Sevastopol will be lost. Sevastopol does have fortress supply, so it won't suffer any supply penalties uh, supposedly they can build enough food, I guess, for, you know, the coming winter and summers. Um, but outside of that, I mean, you know, everything, the Black Sea is effectively surrounded um, by the Axis if Batumi were to fall. So um, this turn, we focus on Soviet production, pretty much build up all these units, uh, build up an HQ, build up a new a few extra Soviet armies along the border of Turkey. We don't want the Axis to... Uh, do a diplomatic event called TX in the rule book. I can go ahead and show you all that. And, you know, you go in the rule book of Eurofront and uh, pretty much go all the way to the bottom. We go to Axis Diplomacy. You can look at TX. Turkey joins the Axis. You got to look at the uh, preconditions. Uh, the Soviets need to be um, allies. You know, the Balkans needs to be pacified, meaning that, that essentially the Axis have neutralized the Balkans. Um, or Germany is within Mother Russia, all conditions apply so far. The only remaining condition is to count the number of undefended Soviet cities on the Turkish border. And if our role um, uh, at the very minimum needs to be two of those, two of those cities, if, if it's less than, or, um, less than that count, then you know, Turkey would join the war. So as long as we hold on to three of the four cities bordering Turkey, it will be technically impossible for Turkey to join the war. But if the Axis do to end up taking two, possibly three cities that are bordering Turkey, the odds go up much, much higher to, for Turkey to join the Axis. So Soviet production, um, I end up pretty much building up our defensive line. You know, I build up this mountain. Uh, basically, it's some sort of mountain Soviet army, right? You know, with that little triangle there representing that it has double fire and mountainous terrain. You know, I built up uh, this, uh, what is this, a 19th Army, built up this 8th Met Corps. Um, I also built up this Southern HQ because we want to have um, at least two HQs in the sector since, oh, uh, excuse me, Stavka will be under strength. Um, trying to n not spend any more Stavka for the next two turns so that I can build it up to full strength again. Uh, what else? And then ideally build up Soviet reserves, but I think because of limited production, we don't see much for uh, Soviet builds. As we move over to the Mediterranean front, um, we look at the British production, and their production was, what was it, 30 production points for this month. And so we do uh, 
six dice rolls, each one representing five production points. Six by five is 30. Um, they end up with, uh, what is that, 13 plus another nine. That's uh, 22 production points that the British received and um, pretty much found a combination that was the most effective for the British. Uh, I believe what we end up doing, I you know shuffle around trying to figure out the right combination. But I think what I eventually set my eyes on is uh, I build up this uh, British mech core by another step. So that will cost nine production points. Um, I also been building this uh, British infantry corps, the 10th, rebuilding it up again from its defeat at Tobruk. And we just want to have as many troops as possible, basically uh, not only protecting Alexandria, but also protecting its flank, right? You know, the axis could in theory circle around. So we want to make sure that we can protect the Delta from any river crossing and also Cairo. And as long as we hold on to Alexandria, the Axis will not have any supplies that it will be extending if they do decide to flank, right? Because in, um, in the Mediterranean front, the supply distance from your supply source is only one hex. So that basically means, you know, the current supply, uh, rail supply for the Axis is at El Amain. It is no further east than that. So they really, Alexandria not only is a major naval base for the British, it is also um, a major logistical hub. Uh, you can see that there are three rail lines, um, which typically, I mean, if you look at the Eastern Front, I mean, that th three rail lines is nothing, right? I mean, Eastern Front is just filled with all sorts of rail lines. Uh, same thing with the Western Front as well. I mean, the whole, all of Europe is just filled with rail lines. But when we look at somewhere like North Africa, you can see that there's barely any. There's none in Libya or pretty much none in Libya. There are more in Egypt, um, but they, they, a lot of them concentrate here at Alexandria. So as long as we can hold on to Alexandria, the British will be in good shape. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, so then, I, yeah, I, I even decided to leave this British uh, field HQ at level zero, and then I decided to build up this, these units. Um, another thing to point out was that for the British production, we also had not just the 30 uh, production points uh, by default, but we also transferred over a, uh, we also did a 10, uh, 10 point uh, production transfer from the Western Front to the Mediterranean Front. And then I did that die roll, that was an extra four. So from 22 production points, we actually go up to 26 production points on this month. And I end up spending that 26, uh, basically nine on this British mech core and then another 12 on this uh, British uh, Infantry Corps, rebuilding it, that costs 12. And then the last remaining five, I go ahead and build up this uh, Mediterranean Theater HQ right there located in Port Said, north of Suez, of the Suez Canal, pretty much. So, you know, part of our, like, secondary, you know, part of our, like, our strategic command of sorts, but it will give us a little bit more movement options for the following turn following turns that they come about so that is pretty much what we do for the mediterranean front as far as the western front uh british and american uh, production we basically end up rebuilding uh this british hq supreme hq it was at level one we build it up to a level two and then i think i also build up this other hq that we have in gibraltar i also build it up to full strength as well and that's when, when it happens right there. And then I also deploy a new reserve. You know, I deploy reinforcements on this month. You know, the uh, this is the month of October. So the U.S. 6th Corps does arrive to the theater of Europe. And it also arrives with a beachhead ready. So I can place these reinforcements in any major port that the Western Allied powers control. So the ability for the Allies to bring in reinforcements is far more flexible than any of the other nations because we can pretty much put them anywhere as long as there's a major port that we control. So hypothetically, if we were to secure Antwerp for whatever reason, hypothetically, we could be able to send uh, put, put new reinforcement units directly there on the port itself. So I find that very interesting. Um, and then we also decided to, you know, they're going to deploy those beachheads. So now the British and Americans both 
have two ready beachheads. Keep in mind that each beachhead, beachhead costs 20 production points. So you're looking at 40 production points with these two units, these two beachheads. And the idea is, you know, if we launch an amphibious invasion and we need an emergency supply source, we, we're going to get that from these beachheads. And not only that, the beachheads also provide fire support as well, increasing these uh, core, these amphibious units from single fire to double fire, both offensively and defensively. And you can guess what that firepower is. It basically is the support of offshore naval artillery. So that's that. And then I go ahead and switch over to the Axis production. And for that, we start on the Western Front. The Axis production for this month on the Western Front is 17 production points, 10 plus 7. And then um, I actually wanted to show you all something else too. Let me turn on my little highlighter icon here. Yeah, there we go. There you all can see that a little better. Um, but yeah, the uh, situation for the German army, you know, we're looking very good in Western France, uh, Northern France. I'm feeling very confident. We have a full strength HQ right there, ready to go. So if the British do decide to attack and say Normandy, or if they decide to attack Brest or Cherbourg again, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna have to face a strong German counteroffensive. If they try to land somewhere further south of that, they're going to have to deal with, uh, with the German Navy, uh, with the supply, the limited supplies that they're going to have to deal with. And, you know, if they decide to attack anywhere else, I mean, they could land in Denmark. Um, but, you know, if they, if they do land in Denmark, we're going to just fortify Hamburg. And then, that, you know, I, I'm gonna, I'll, put four, I'll stack up four units there for the remainder of the war and pretty much ensure that they, they cannot break out of Denmark. Uh, maybe we can even launch a counteroffensive, and then the same thing with Copenhagen. You know, as long as we hold on to those two cities, I, I'm not too concerned with what happens in Denmark. And then uh, same thing with uh, Holland. I mean, we at least have two strong corps protecting that area. And then of course this area of Belgium and northern France, we have these two uh, level two forts. Each fort is double, uh, excuse me, triple fire and triple defense. So in theory, the Allies are going to have to score six hits. To break through, not an easy thing to do for the first wave of an amphibious invasion. Um, this core, though, that I have here in Brussels, actually, I think I deployed it by mistake. So I proceed to, uh, I think I just sent it back to the force pool because um, technically you can deploy a unit in Brussels. Uh, German reinforcements, on the other hand, they can only arrive either in Germany itself, in any of the major or minor cities, or we can go ahead and put them in these victory cities, which are the ones with a square. So Paris, you know, Milan, Rome, let's see, uh, Sofia, Athens, Belgrade, Bucharest, Warsaw. You've been seeing a lot of reinforcements arrive from Warsaw. And, and, and note that there are no victory cities in the Soviet Union for Germany to deploy the reinforcements. So that's just that's just their way of, you know, deploying, you know, units in the in in the third reich occupied territories pretty much so um send that unit back to the force pool because i'm pretty sure on the last turn last video i had i was just explaining away like how that works um that that fortress unit and i think i accidentally left it there um but then yeah we go ahead you know send a militia reinforcement that the germans get in uh, this month in october you know, so we're, we're, we're getting a lot of militia. I'm not really all too excited about militia units, but at the very least, they they at least give, they work well with the fog of war because they keep the, um, the British and Americans guessing, but they really are not able to stop any, um, any allied breakthrough, I don't think. Uh, they can only take two hits and they only have single fire. And once they take two hits, they automatically surrender. So they're very vulnerable units. They they work best with with uh, in conjunction with the support of other formations. Not only that, but because they're militia, um, they cannot even participate in uh, regular movement. They can only be moved around with the uh, Supreme HQ. So they they're extremely static units. They're basically, as the name su suggests, they're militia units. So they're extremely localized units. They're not very well suited for any sustained operations nor for any sustained uh, movement or mobilization they're just good at uh, they're just good as an occupying force pretty much nothing else um, so there's that 
Um, we go ahead and just build up a few more units. Um, I was experimenting, trying to figure out if I wanted to build up OBW, because if we can build OBW up to full strength, there is the possibility that we could attack Malta. But I think with the, the multitask of trying to take Malta, trying to uh, keep the Western Front fortified, and trying to move any more reinforcements to the Eastern Front, and then probably the fourth one is uh, sustain our North African operations, is simply too much for with only 17 production points per turn on the Western Front. So I'm thinking, you know, we, it's, it's just best to focus on OKW, since our Supreme HQ really is like the backbone of of uh, of our of our military. I mean, if it wasn't for the Supreme HQ, we, our movements would be so much more limited. So it's important to keep this um, OKW at full strength, basically. Um, so there's that, and then I think for the uh, yeah for the Mediterranean front, the Axis production they get some pretty good production as well. They get 22 production on this month. And I think I go ahead and I just spend it all on not the Africa core that you see here, um, but I instead I just spend it on uh, building up some of these units, including this 10th Army, Italian 10th Army, that's six production points. The Desert Africa Corps, rebuilding that up, that's another 12. That puts me at 18. And then the last remaining four, I think I spend it on this, uh, this Panzer, uh, Panzer, excuse me, Paratrooper Militia unit, which is a very odd unit. Because I think it has double fire, but it is still a militia unit. So I, I, I'm pretty sure this is supposed to represent like a small, uh, maybe a regiment. Maybe it's a, just a smaller skilled unit compared to the other units. But relatively speaking, they have the same combat power, if not maybe a bit more. So uh, yeah, I was kind of shuffling around those production points, but eventually we build it up. Uh, this 10th Army is built up to uh, uh, by another step, and so is the... Desert Africa core. So, you know, we could in theory attack Alexandria on this turn, but chances are it's going to be very expensive to sustain our attacks any further in Alexandria. So that is that. Um, other moves to do. Um, other moves to do on this turn for production. I think that was it for production. Um, then we of course switch over to the Eastern Front and do the Eastern Front production for Germany. We start by building up OKH, you know, that's a given. OKH also extremely important. Not not as important on the Eastern Front, I don't think, as, as the OKW is on the Western Front. Um, but of course, it's played a really big role in just shifting around units, uh, given the distances. But without a doubt, our field HQs have been really important because they, they've been able to like, they've, they probably, they've, they're overall more effective, I think, at moving more units um, than, than uh, that OKH is, but the only problem is that they, they can only cover one part of the front. They can't cover the whole the whole front. There's just simply not enough of them. So that is that. Um, so I decided to spend like a lot of production on just all the HQs. Um, on the Eastern Front, the Axis have five HQs, right? Three of which right now are in the Southern Front. That's Army Group Center, Army Group A, which is like a mini, uh, you know, mini Army Group, Army Group South, and then Army Group North. Those are four field HQs, and then the fifth one being OKW, the Supreme HQ. So already by just spending, you know, spending it, um, spending a, st a step buildup for every single one of these field HQs, you know, plus this H uh, Supreme HQ, you end up with 50 production points being spent. And then I spent another 10 on this fortress unit that we finally got up to full strength and that we're going to leave behind at Smolensk. This unit triple fire, triple defense. So it's the equivalent of being able to absorb nine hits from the Soviet army. And then I think that in conjunction with a few German infantry should do well at fortifying Smolensk. It's going to be very tough for the Soviets to break out of Smolensk. Maybe not impossible, but, but definitely very tough. And then likewise with Bryansk, I mean, I feel pretty confident just leaving like one, maybe two units behind. And then, you know, with that, we should be able to pull out all these Panzer Corps. I have two, I have four Panzer Corps there, the equivalent of two Panzer armies right now, located here in the Central Front, and I could pull those out, and they can act as a strategic reserve wherever I want to, wherever I want to put them next. Um, but as we're approaching winter operations, I don't think, I don't really think uh, we're going to use them too much. Uh, 
I'm going to probably wait until summer 1943 before I decide to do anything more. So that is that. Um, when we look at the entire the total production for the Axis on the Eastern Front, it was 89 production points. So if we've spent 60, we're left with 20, 29 left pretty much. And that remaining 29, I pretty much spend it on like trying to rebuild as many units as I could pretty much here in the Southern Front in, in an effort to continue our drive towards towards Baku pretty much so that's what I go ahead and do you know you can see these units and twops they're being built up I even built a panzer corps I built up this mountain unit that's another five production points right and then um, I think I end up building up this other unit in Leningrad as well just to make sure that Leningrad we have triple defense on Leningrad but I want to make sure Leningrad is well protected these dice roll that you see here this one roll of six was a diplomatic event to see if I could get Syria to join the Axis. And if we look at the diplomatic event that I was rolling for, you can see there's this uh, um, ME diplomatic event, Mideast Uprising. And the preconditions include the Balkans are pacified, Bulgaria and Greece are both Axis controlled, check and check. Um, then we got to count the Axis major ports in Libya slash Egypt. Right now, the Axis have two major ports in Libya, Tripoli and Benghazi, respectively. And then um, that means that our kind of our, our dice roll value is a value of two. And if we score, if we roll that, if we roll that die, and we get less than or equal to that count, meaning that if we roll a one or a two, basically a one in three chance, um, we can get one of these nations, one of these mandates to occur either Iraq or Syria to join the Axis. Now, Iraq, Iraq's um, mandate already occurred um, in our 1941 scenario. So that would leave Syria as the only one left. And it would be nice to get Syria in the war because once we do, it's going to put pressure on the British from like their rear guard. So the idea is that we may be able to like surround Egypt. And, and that's kind of the strategy right now for the Axis is try to like squeeze the British out of uh, Syria, Palestine, and Iraq. You know, if we can get the British out of these three areas, then in theory, the road to the um, Iraqi oil fields, including Kirkuk, Basra, Abadan, all these areas could in theory be reached by the, by the Africa Corps. And if we, can, if we can occupy even two of the three, ideally occupy Abadan, but even two of the three, if we occupied all four, not only would the British, or excuse me, all three, not only would the British lose 10 production points, but the Axis would gain 20 production points because the Axis resources are doubled. So it would be a huge strategic win if the Axis were to, were to take this oil. Now, I don't know how realistic this actually is in, in, um, in the war. You know, just, just because you have your, uh, your army occupying these oil fields doesn't mean that uh, you automatically have access to that oil. Uh, you also have to keep in mind that there would, there would likely be a scorched earth policy by the British, and they would destroy these oil fields before they were captured. Another thing to point out is even if the German army were to rebuild somehow with like some sort of corps of engineers, rebuild these oil fields, it would take months to do. And even if they were to build them up, there was still no guarantee of easily transferring all that oil from Iraq to um to Berlin, basically. And, and keep in mind that we're going to have to move that oil. Um, I think it actually has to be in rail supply. In fact, I'm pretty sure the rules pertain to this has to be in rail supplies, meaning that the only way we would actually get this oil likely would be coming from through Turkey. So the only way we could get that oil to Berlin in a realistic way is with the help of the uh, Turkish rail infrastructure. So that's something to point out. I don't think you can actually use as road supplies. So We'll see if we can we can actually make a progress that far east. But right now, the bottleneck battle is Alexandria. Despite the success at El Alamein, the Axis still have yet another major battle that they need to break through in order to really uh, make uh, substantial progress in Egypt. So that was that first dice roll was a diplomatic event. The Axis roll a six, so that is that was too high of a die roll. So that diplomatic event doesn't occur. The next two, next two dice rolls that we do is to check for the weather. And this is for the Eastern Front. You can look at the weather on the production tables. 
since we're in the month of October, you know, it's a 50-50 roll, even for, for dry, odd, for mud. The Western Front has no rolls for the month of October, but the next, uh, the month of November, the following month, we will. Um, and then, of course, something similar for the following month with the Soviets, or for the Eastern Front, except uh, this time it would be between mud and snow in the month of November. So with that, uh, we have good weather on the Eastern Front, so the Axis take advantage of this favorable weather. And then I go ahead, I, I basically move the weather you know, icon, and then I decide to activate OKH, as well as Army Group Center, and I decide to make a blitz uh, with, with the intent of trying to take Batumi. So I basically get Army Group Center to mobilize as many cores as we can. I think we end up attacking uh, Batumi with an entire Panzer group. Yes, we attack Batumi with one infantry mountain uh, unit, the 49th Corps, with, uh, supported by two uh, Panzer Corps, um, a, a total of basically eight German divisions. So huge, not only numerical advantage, but also firepower advantage for the Axis. And we're trying to take it in one turn, right, one fortnight um, without a blitz. So that would be about a week of combat to take Batumi, more or less, maybe a few days. And then we also move up the second corps um, from Tuops to Sukumi. Uh, um, but if I were to leave it here, if I were to leave it in this setup, in theory, the Soviets could launch a counteroffensive, which wouldn't be unique to the Red Army. And if they were to severely damage this unit at Sukumi, we actually wouldn't be able to move reinforcements very easily to, to, uh, to, uh, to contest the hex. And the reason why is because any units that are moving across mountainous terrain have to stop on that movement phase. And if I look at the player aid card, and to confirm that, you can look at the terrain effects. We go down here, we look at mountainous terrain. Tells you the stacking limit, tells you the hex sides uh, limit. It also tells you the movement. And upon entry of that hex, you have to stop for that phase. Same thing with the marshes. Um, otherwise, we, we could have just sent these Panzer Corps, the 24th and the 58th, I could have sent them both easily at full speed across. But because it's mountainous terrain, the, you know, the movements are, are more restricted, right? So as it, as it stands right now, this, this setup is not very advantageous for the Axis simply because if we fail to take Batumi, and then for whatever reason we lose Sukumi, you know, then our entire Panzer group will be out of supplies, and it will be a very bad day for the Axis. So I think I end up blitzing. Uh, I think I was sh shifting a few units around trying to figure out what to do. Um, this Army Group A move will be a supreme move because it's out of range of Army Group Center. Since it's at level 2, it only has two hexes of range. So that was one supreme move that I did. Um, with uh, OKH, I also do. I was also doing some more supreme moves, trying to advance towards Sevastopol. I think I finally realized, though, that attacking Sevastopol on this turn is just not going to be very feasible. I also transfer Army Group North. I wanted it to. I wanted to move it to Sevastopol to Crimea to take it, but since since winter is only like winter is possible on the next turn, and the Soviets could launch an offensive. I figure we need to have at least one field HQ somewhere in, in the uh, central front, at least one, you know, to, to hold off whatever actions, attack actions the Soviet army has planned out. But my overall strategy for the German army in the winter operations is just build up your defense, stack up as many German units, units as you can, and, and make sure that the front line is a, is a static line, kind of like a World War I scenario. You want to have a stalemate in the winter uh, for, for the Axis on the Eastern Front. Of course, as the Soviets are trying to break that stalemate, right? So I do it, the supreme move and I move Army Group North from the Leningrad region and I essentially put it right here dead center. So it should be able to support either a Soviet attack uh, or, or support the German forces against a Soviet attack either at Smolensk, although our defenses here look really good, or probably more concerning, is um, a Soviet attack on this kind of more open terrain area, which, which is going to be harder to defend in the winter operations. So yeah, I kind of cancel some movements. I decide to pull back two corps from Pavlovsk, and I basically get him to move further, w further west 
to help kind of create a stronger defense here in the sector. I think I transferred another Panzer Corps to the sector as well. And um, yeah, so Army Group A is going to move forward. I, I decided to move it there instead. Um, so I do a lot of adjustments. This wasn't a uh, touch base uh, Eurofront or like, you know, analogous to touch base chess. So I do like undo a lot of moves. But of course, when you're playing with someone, you know, chances are, you know, whatever piece you, you move, like that's it, right? And you, you know, depending on who you play with. Um, but it definitely makes, uh, it, can, it can save you a lot of time when you just make one move and, and do it right. So one supreme move is to move this 42nd Corps by rail from this area here, Pavlovsk, right, which was kind of intended to, to siege Voronezh. I'm going to withdraw and then move it to the, to the, to the deep south there. And then um, that Panzer Corps is going to fall back to Belgorod, kind of act as a, you know, operational reserve. And then I also go ahead and move this Panzer Corps and I stack it up in Stadi Osko, which really is like the main defensive line, right? It's, it's the area where the Soviets could, in theory, send four units from all sides, pretty much, or at least, you know, two sides from the uh, east and northeast and then another two from the northwest. They could put four units in Sariosko, and if they, if the Soviets do break out or, or severely cripple our defense, then, I mean, the road to, Kar to Kharkov is going to be a lot more open, and, and our army is going to be vulnerable to Soviet encirclement and so on. So it's important that, again, we just maintain a strong defense. So, yeah, that was, that was a supreme move. So to recap, we did one rail move, moved the 42nd Corps down in the deep south to Tuops, and that was one rail move. Um, another rail move I had, I just realized, I don't think this unit can even do that. I think I still make a few more adjustments. Yeah, I decided to move like Army Group A, you know, uh, get, it, get it next to this HQ because um, that way during the Blitz phase, I can still deploy it. I moved this 54th Corps with the... Uh, with the uh, heavy mortars to Sim Ferropol, just to be one step closer to Sevastopol. And then I move the 40th Corps, I pull that out, and then the 42nd Corps, I move by rail. I decide to move it by rail, and actually I put it somewhere here further east. And then I shift around a few more units like this. This Corps, you know, it started up here being commanded by Army Group Center. I decide to move it a little bit, put it in a little bit more aggressive position near Orzoni Kitsin, and, and also because it's still mountainous terrain, it's going to be able to protect our flank pretty nicely, and it's going to be hard for the Soviets to dislodge our position there. So, you know, that combined with the river defense, with the Panzer Corps here, I'm feeling pretty confident that our rail supply from Brostov, which right now is our only supply path, I'm pretty sure right now, to, su to, su to supply our main units here in the south, is protected um, as we make as we make a push on Batumi. However, once we take Batumi, the supply situation will change. Um, and then, yeah, I use these markers to indicate some rail moves, just making sure that I did six supreme moves correctly, and then I did. So I did like one, two, three, and then the other three was four, five, six. There you go. And then we go ahead and do the battle of Batumi. And so and then we start with the airstrike. Um, we score four and a two that's um, with, with double fire that's no hits. The defenders roll three dice at single fire. Um, they score one hit, so they're going to damage our weaker uh, mountain core. And then we have the two Panzer Corps to roll. The first Panzer Corps with double fire scores three hits, and that's enough. And, and that alone just completely clean sweeps this entire Soviet 37th Army. And just like that, Batumi falls. So that was that was a very easy victory for the Axis. Um, and then the next thing I do uh, is do the blitz phase of Army Group Center. You know, I reduce it by one. Any units within one hex of Army Group Center are now deployed. And then I go ahead and pretty much move up the Second Corps and the 58th Corps, and I move them up to Kutaisi. And they they basically set up a new defense. Um, so that's that's pretty good. Um, still vulnerable to a Soviet counteroffensive, but I feel confident that they, they should be able to hold the line. 
and then potentially on the next turn we can still launch our own counteroffensive. I just I don't think the Soviets are going to be able to blitz if if they have the same combat strength. My presumption was is that if their combat strength was the same as it was in the Caucasus Mountains, you know, we're talking about you know level two, two step, three step Soviet infantry armies. Um, they're just not strong enough to really break through. They're gonna the Soviets are gonna need either like a shock army, uh, a, a tank army, maybe both. You know, they're gonna need something around that order of of magnitude and firepower if they really intend to break through. So. And then I also go ahead and uh, mobilize Army Group A uh, from Tuops to Sukumi. And now, now Army Group A you can kind of uh, continue uh, running the show um, while Army Group Center can pretty much, you know, deactivate. And then I think I, mo yeah, I mobilize it a little bit more north. And its job will probably be to protect this kind of northern wing, uh, this northern flank, as we make the southern flank from uh, uh, through the Caucasus mountain, Caucasus mountain range towards Baku. And I, and I think in order to take Baku, we're going to have to push with Army Group Center uh, north of the Caucasus and then Army Group A south of the Caucasus. And both tribes, in theory, should be enough to to maybe take Baku. And we'll see. I don't. I really don't know. Um, we'll see if we have enough firepower. I will say that thus far we've, we've, we've been making steady progress. Um, so that's been quite impressive. Um, so there's that. Also, now that Batumi has fallen, you can see that the uh, Eastern Black Sea will now become a Axis-controlled uh, basin, right? Uh, because they control the naval base. And so that means that the Axis could trace a supply path from Batumi uh, north across the strait um, because the Axis control both sides, right? The 54th Corps not only was meant to pin down Sevastopol, but with its own zone of control, we can actually control Kerch. We already control Nobody Seisk. That means we control both sides of the strait. That means that supplies can go through the strait. And then that supplies can go, say, all the way up to Mariupol or Rostov, right? And then those supplies can then move via rail all the way back to Berlin. So as long as we as long as long uh, we control Batumi, control the straits, and control Rostov, we actually can supply our advancing units um, right now that are pushing onto Baku via sea. That's a really unique case for the Axis, and we don't have any interference from, from uh, Soviets or the Allies. Um, but because the Soviets still control Sevastopol, the Western Black Sea is still not available as a supply path. I mean, it is not a guaranteed supply path, right? It, it, comes, it comes down to dice rolls, whether, whether or not we can get supplies going through, right? Uh, depends on how well the Soviet Navy operating from Sevastopol can interdict our supply path there. Um, so there's still an incentive to take Sevastopol because once we take Sevastopol, this bl entire Black Sea becomes an Axis lake pretty much. Um, and, uh, you know, the Soviets could even take Rostov, right? They could even take Novorossiysk. Um, they could even take the entire Crimean Peninsula all but Sevastopol. And in theory, we could still supply our units pushing on Baku. So... I would argue that geopolitically, you know, gaining this supply path is a huge strategic win for the German Ost here. Huge strategic win, um, especially when you're considering this war from the perspective as a from the perspective of a grand strategic conflict. Right now, if you were looking at this from the perspective of simply a from an operational standpoint for the German army, you'd probably argue that there's a lot of problems here for the German army. Um, you know, fighting very far away from the home front, right? You know, you're not able, the terrain is not favorable, right? This terrain is not favorable for operations. You know, uh, you're not able to synchronize with other formations that are way out there, right? Um, so there's a number of operational, we'll say like inconveniences for the German army. But from a grand strategic perspective, I would argue that this is probably one of the better strategic moves that the German army has been able to pull off in the war so far. Probably around on, on a similar scale to what I would guess would be like the very successful Axis campaign that was done to take Norway back in 1940 before the Battle of France. Taking Norway basically allowed Germany to uh, keep Sweden under cooperating terms with the Third Reich and um, that combined with Finland 
joining um, to joining Germany in the war, it basically ensured that all of Scandinavia pretty much was under the the hemisphere or the geopolitical sphere of influence of the Third Reich in World War II, and so it's a, it was a it was a very swift campaign of Norway, um, swifter than than many others in some ways at least it was, and because of that, uh, it it changed the whole war you know in, in a notably strategic way. Uh, because the Allies never attacked Norway. In fact, there were still German units defending Norway as late as 1945 while Berlin was being attacked. So it goes to show that, that Norway was, was uh, that Scandinavia really had this kind of, you know, uh, strategic role in the European conflict, um, but it was quickly, it seemed like it was quickly uh, dealt with by, by the, uh, the Wehrmacht early on in the war. Um, but, but of course, there's a lot more stories to unpack about what was happening in, in occupation. I think probably the coolest story is how the uh, British commandos were able to, to destroy the, uh, the German heavy water, the type, of, uh, the type of water you would need to create a n- nuclear bomb. And, and because they, they, they sunk a, I think it was a freighter um, or a ferry that was carrying this very, very valuable heavy water, uh, deuterium, think it's what it was called um, instead of hydrogen something like that and this this ship very cool documentary I highly recommend it um, mark productions big shout out to mark productions and and this freighter was was sunk as it was moving across and all that heavy water I'm sure it was very expensive it was sunk it took months to make and, and that's the kind of water you need to to actually um, keep a re- nuclear reactor um, cooling it was essentially a coolant um, but it was also it also helped in the, the 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 fission process, so it was very very interesting. So, anyways, with that said, um, that pretty much concludes the Axis momentum and offensive for the first fortnight of October 1942. Um, then we basically go ahead and switch to the Soviets and see how the Soviets respond accordingly. Um, their situation is a lot more limited. Why? Because Stavka is completely exhausted. And, um, you know, I will say, well, well, although we have a pretty decent defense east, or excuse me, west of Tbilisi, you know, I'll tell you now, this understrength 10th Army and this uh, Soviet mech corps are not going to be strong enough to withstand um, a, a blitz by a German panzer group. No way. Um, we, we've seen how the German panzer groups can operate. Two panzer corps with some air support are plenty, plus with a blitz phase, are plenty to smash this unit. They could, in theory, actually destroy us on just one attack. And then if they do, and then they break through, it's possible that Tbilisi could be cut off. It's possible that uh, this area, Lenin Nakan, could also be cut off, and the Axis could be making their way as far as Kiro Vabad. Um, and that would be that would, that would literally leave the road to Baku wide open, and we, we don't want that. So what I did strategically with the Soviets, um, given how quickly Batumi fell, you know the Soviets were pretty much demoralized. We we fell back, activated this understrength HQ, still strong enough to command units in the immediate vicinity, and I and I decided to fall back. So I pull back the 45th Army, 45th Army to Lenin Nakan. Um, that's where it's going to make its home, its final defense. It will fight to the last man at Leninakan because if we lose this town, the the odds of Turkey joining the war are now a real possibility. And then I go ahead and deploy this Mekor to uh, Kirovabad, right? So that if the Germans do decide to attack, they're going to have to attack with uh, no combat support. So it's going to be a lot harder for them to break out. And then, you know, uh, the 27th Army here, Kadre Strength, it can at least fill in, just, just at least fill in this open space on the front, you know, has double defense. And then I do, I do go ahead and I move the, this uh, 19th Army, at least these two armies, and, and defend Tbilisi and hopefully create like a little mini Stalingrad defense. Um, essentially, that's what, I'm, that's what I was aiming for. And then deactivate the HQ, and then I go ahead and I move the HQ east of Kirovabad, so that, you know, it should be out of range from a German attack. You know, even if the Germans blitz, I don't think the Germans can actually reach that area because, you know, this Army Group A only has a range of two for, for combat support. So that is that. And that's what I did for the Soviets, nothing else. 
And um, so we're trying to create a de strategic defense in depth and, and buy a little bit more time, let the Axis advance. Um, but the, the main junctions, Leninakan, Tbilisi, and Kirovabad, I, I'd rather not lose any one of these three. If we lose any one of them, this entire like defensive position pretty much collapses, I'm pretty sure. So we want to make sure that we can buy as much time as we can. And so the weather is changing. You know, the mud season will sl slow down the axis, and then the winter initiative should help us uh, help the Soviets maybe even launch a counteroffensive before the axis have time to launch their own attacks. So that is that. So that was the Soviet turn. The British, I go ahead and activate their Supreme HQ. It's got the four Supreme moves. Um, moving those Supreme moves over to the Mediterranean front, I decide that although there is the risk that uh, there could be a revolt in Iraq or a uprising in Palestine, you know, now that we don't have any occupying forces in these areas, it's very possible that all three nations, Palestine, Iraq, Syria, could undergo some, um, we, we, could, we could find ourselves basically dealing with, uh, you know, Axis forces that are going to operate from these nations, but... Having said that, Egypt still takes the number one priority, and there's still a chance that we can beat off um, Rommel's offensive. And so the idea is to move as many units as we can to protect it. And so um, while, while although Alexandria is well fortified, the fact that we have no units to repulse an Axis uh, flank attack that could potentially cross the Nile River, you know, maybe interfere with our supply bases, you know, like take, for example, if, if Port Said is is contested, we can't have a rail supply going to Alexandria anymore. And so Alexandria is just in a vulnerable position, if you can't tell already. So the two supreme moves I, I did was to move up these two units, just try to protect the, the, the eastern banks of the Nile River, the Nile, the Nile Delta and Cairo. And, and so oddly enough, I would actually argue that this, this situation that we see in Egypt right now, is very analogous to the Stalingrad defense that the Soviet army had at Stalingrad, but instead of Stalingrad, it's Alexandria. But it's a very much it's very much a Stalingrad-like scenario where we have a strong concentration to protect the city, and we're steadily building up other units to protect the flanks. And right now, the Axis have to figure out: Are they going to go directly to hit the city? Maybe they can bypass the city and try to cross this river, although the logistics s suggest otherwise. So the, the siege of Egypt has officially occurred, without a doubt. Battle of Egypt, Battle of Alexandria. Um, there's probably a number, number of names that we could give it. But right now, the British are holding up a defense. And I think they're going to, chances are, they may end up fighting to the last man at Alexandria. Or we'll probably hold out for as long as we can. And, uh, and then maybe fall back once, once we know that we can't hold out much longer. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there. So that was it for the British. Well, actually, not exactly. Um, the next move I do um, was actually declare war on Vichy France. And so the British do declare war on Vichy France. British and Americans, the Americans are in the war, albeit barely, but they're, they're starting to arrive in numbers. Um, and so we do declare war on Vichy France. I go ahead and deploy the Vichy French forces that are now an official satellite. They're no more are they neutral cooperating. And, you know, there, there's a lot of rules that, that talk about the, the state of neutral nations in the conflict. It's not too complicated, but, you know, I haven't spoken too much about it in this playthrough. I think in some future video, if I start with a 1939 scenario, that's really where you can see more of these events take place. But, you know, to sum it up in a, in a quick nutshell, you've got this war and peace rule that talks about all of the, uh, the basically the three states that you can find a nation in in this game. Either they can be belligerent, which has been what we've mostly been seeing, right? Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, British Empire, United States are all examples of belligerent na nations, right? Fascist Italy, all examples of belligerent nations. Then you've got neutral nations that haven't joined the war yet, um, which I guess probably would have been nations like Yugoslavia or Greece. Uh, currently, a, a good example of a neutral nation would be Turkey. Right, like one hundred percent neutral, and then there's a third state a status that you can find for these unit uh, nations, which is cooperating, uh, which means that technically the nation is still neutral, but they they they're essentially um, they're doing they're doing a little bit to cooperate with one side. They they cooperate they cooperate in two notable ways. 
the first way is that they allow that nation um, they basically give all their production to that nation so that's a huge that's a huge change right so you know right now for example um, I believe it is uh, yeah it's Sweden that I think is cooperating with the Axis um, and so I believe Stockholm at the very least Stockholm's production I don't know I don't know if it's Stockholm or or this area further north it's kind of hard to read it's I think it says Galivare or Galivar, Galivare. I think it's Galivare. I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but the the point I'm trying to make is that there are supplies that are moving from Sweden to say uh, Germany right now. Even though Sweden is technically neutral, they are in cooperating terms. Another effect that 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 the other notable effect is that you can actually move units by rail across that neutral space. You can't leave units behind. But basically, that nation is saying, you know what, you know, you can, you're, you're free to move your armies for logistical reasons across our nation. Just don't leave them behind in our territory. So that means that if I wanted to reinforce, say, Olu from Norway, I can move a unit from Namsos across the all these rail lines that are that are mostly in Sweden, and I can move them to Olu no problem. And that's because of the cooperating rules. Um, and then uh, I think I think right now Hungary and Romania both are technically part of the Axis. They're the part of the Axis coalition right now. So they are they are they are, they are belligerent units. Um, now Vichy France would have been that great example of a cooperating nation, right? Another example. Um, they were cooperating, meaning that they were technically neutral, but they were giving their production to to uh, the Third Reich, um, and they would even allow the Axis to move units via you know, via rail across French North Africa. But now, since the Allies declared war on Vichy France, this nation is officially belligerent, so now we're going to put its armies on the board, right? And so we decide to keep a historical setup, and the way you set it up pretty much is, you know, one unit occupies every one of these uh, either minor or major ports, Casablanca, uh, or Oran, Algiers, Bizerte, and Tunis, as well as uh, here in the south of France, um, Marcel, Marcel, and Toulon. Um, I wonder if it's pronounced Marcel. I think it might be pronounced or Mar Marcel, Marcel, something like that. <laughs> that uh, yeah, you know. And then Toulon, Toulon. So with that said, uh, this is going to be, um, keep in mind that because um, the Allies did activate the second front and they have the strategic initiative, Vichy France is already um, demoralized. And demoralized nations, demoralized satellites is what they call them, all these other like minor nations um, that are not like the main superpowers, um, including Italy. Italy technically is a satellite. Um, these nations um, are very vulnerable to surrendering if they've been demoralized. And so, you know, other rules to keep in mind in War and Peace talks about alliance reactions. Um, I, I wonder if I had to do an alliance reaction actually on this turn. Let's find out. I don't think I had to. But alliance reactions would have, a, does it apply to Vichy France? I don't think so. No. No alliance reactions for Vichy France. Uh, but that's another thing, much more relevant in 1939. But again, it's just a random probability of nations you know, the geopo geopolitics, the, the diplomacy, mainly in a war. I'm trying to see who's going to join which, which, si which side, pretty much. I think we'll, if, we, if we had a, the equivalent of a World War I ver version of this game, you would have so many alliance reactions taking place, definitely. Uh, especially at the start of the conflict. Um, other rules for the uh, war and peace. I've talked about diplomatic events, which are the ones that, that the player does have some control over. Right, and then the last phase to keep in mind are the, is the political phase, and this is where you check for demoralization. You check uh, if there's an armistice. This applies to France only. You check if any nations are going to re uh, revolt or some nations are going to surrender. And then um, I think what's the other one? You check if nations have been defeated or conquered. You check if naval supremacy has been achieved. Right, and then and then the the rule book goes on to explain each and every one of these rules. I believe armistice only applies to, it pr applies to the French armistice. That's it. Uh, maybe even the Finnish armistice as well. So two armistices can occur in the game. 
Um, demoralization is, is a little bit more relevant to what we're talking about. And it says demoralized nations can surrender. It talks about uh, France, Norway, satellite Italy, uh, all of which, no, excuse me, the first two occurred. Satellite Italy has yet to occur. Um, but then we have minor axis satellites that can also uh, be demoralized um, if the uh, diplomatic event second front occurred, occurs as it has already done. So, so because of that, um, Vichy France is vulnerable to that, to that kind of, uh, uh, what is it called? That kind of uh, surrendering, pretty much. And then there's also revolts, and it basically revolts allow there to be uh, the Allies can deploy these like militia units or these these rebel groups in different nations. And you can see those reinforcement units here. Um, they include, uh, you know, Italy may, may actually deploy like a, an army, the equivalent of an army or a division to join the Allies if, if Italy surrenders. Same thing if the Allies invade Yugoslavia. Same thing if they invade uh, France or Vichy France, as it will happen very moment, uh, very soon. And then also Greece, right? So these are all possibilities right now. Uh, to deploy these these reinforcements. And then the last thing I wanted to show y'all is the surrendering rules. And we basically have two satellite types. You got maritime satellites and you got land satellites. And the thing to keep in mind is this term that they call, which is war wariness. But all you really have to do is just, um, there's going to be a change in either uh, territory. There's, a, there's essentially a change in territory. And that is your war wariness. The more the Allies gain control of a certain type of territory, the more susceptible that nation is to surrendering. And so kind of like the diplomatic event where there's that die roll and that you're trying to beat the odds, you know, the odds will eventually favor um, the Allies as they gain more territory. So for mar mar maritime satellites, it, the, the territory that you focus on is the number of enemy controlled ports, meaning that if the Allies invade French North Africa um, or, say, Italy, the more ports they control, the more vulnerable that nation is to surrendering, right? So it's not just um, Italy and, and uh, Vichy France. It also applies to Spain. I think it also would apply to Norway as well. Um, the other example is land satellites. Same thing, except instead of focusing on ports, you just focus on regular hexes. So this applies to Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, which basically means that if the Soviets do invade Romania, do invade Bulgaria, do invade Hungary, the more territory that they control, the more vulnerable uh, this nation will be at surrendering and possibly switching sides and essentially joining the Allied cause. So that's something to think about. Um, this would be very relevant if you were playing like a 1944 historical scenario where the Red Army was like at the doorstep of either Romania or Hungary or, or Bulgaria. These are the nations that uh, historically switched sides as the Soviets overran their territories. It was part of like the Iron Curtain. It was part of the, you know, the, um, the, the essentially the, the communist regime's uh, sphere of power that eventually led to the very well-known Cold War that, that went on for, for, for decades after World War II. So it all started in World War II, and it started with essentially these, these uh, uh, it essentially started with these, uh, surrenders demoralization of these uh formerly minor axis powers that eventually become minor soviet powers um, so that's all very interesting same thing with spain um, so with all that uh share with you all um now let's go ahead and start the the movement that i wanted to do well i'm actually right now deploying the uh, vichy french forces protecting all the ports right I don't have to worry about Spanish Morocco since that's still technically part of, of Spain. Spain is neutral right now. So allies, uh, I believe they can declare war on neutral powers, but they will be penalized. Um, but they can de declare war on cooperating minor powers without that penalty, right? Let me, let me read up on those rules again. Uh, I'm looking for the second front rule. Here it is. And what does it say? It says, allies may now declare war on neutral cooperating powers with the Axis without betrayal. So that's exactly what is happening now with Vichy France. So the, ally, the Allies don't lose any, like, geopolitical, uh, you know, I guess, momentum as they're trying to attack 
a, new, a neutral nation, although this nation was pro was pro German pretty much pro Axis um, in World War II. So we're going to activate um, this 15th Army Group, and I'm going to make it a Blitz as well as an Invasion HQ because it's invasion. It will control the sea, and all these these two units here that I have. Right, these two amphibious units that have their beachheads, I'm going to use them to attack the French. And so um, I'm going to, I was trying to figure out what the best combination was, and I decided we're going to send um, this Blitz will, will launch two different attacks. Um, one will be directed towards Alger, Algiers, the port of Algiers. The other one will be directed towards this other port of Oran, kind of, kind of as a plan B. And the other thing to point out is that the Vichy French are very susceptible to surrendering uh, or basically their, their, their forces, their actual combat units won't even fight. And so, um, you know, that rule pertains uniquely to France. So if I go here and I look for France in the rule book, um, I can show you all exactly the rule I'm talking about. This is talking about the fronts, talking about minor powers. Talking about the Soviet Union, here it is, France, and then read up on Vichy uh, units. And the rule I'm talking about specifically is called ambivalence. So they used another term. I mean, it's still surrendering, but it's it's not that the whole it's not that the whole government is surrendering. It simply means that the actual combat units are a bit ambivalent to fighting. So what happens is that if the Allies, if the U.S. units score a one or a two in combat. That, that Vichy unit will be eliminated. Basically, the French, like, they, they basically surrender. They surrender before, you know, without, without putting up a, like, super intense fight. They will hold off the first, like, moment that the Allies land. Um, but if the Allies respond, you know, the, the, uh, the U.S. have basically, you know, these odds show that um, with, with a roll of a one or a two in combat, there's a one in three chance that um, Vichy forces against the... Americans will surrender. Likewise, for the British, it's less. It's only a die roll of a one. So uh, the, there is there is an incentive for us to attack as many French units as we can because the more units we attack, there's a higher chance that we can get more units to ambivalently surrender. So um, we go ahead and do the actual combat. Both of these battles, by the way, are going to have unsupported combat because they're just out of range of this HQ, right? This HQ is still a regular field HQ. Its range is three areas away if you wanted to have combat support, right? Um, now, with, with, supreme, with, with naval supremacy, that can be doubled, but we don't have that. We just have regular naval parity. So the only area that we could have actually supported with combat, I believe, would have been uh, not even Casablanca. I mean, Gibraltar is just too far away from any of these ports to provide combat support. But... Because of the ambivalence rules, we still have a very good chance of still breaking through and occupying these areas. So we'll start with the first battle here of Algiers. And the um, French forces are going to roll. They can still repulse the landings. We don't have to worry about a naval, I think they call it a, like naval interception or in, uh, movement interdiction for an invasion. And that's because Gibraltar is actually the naval base for the Alberan Sea. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, so the French roll of five, no repulse. So that's good. That means that we have successfully landed in Algiers. Then we roll the American dice. They score no ones or twos. So nothing happens. They, they also only have single fire. So they score no hits neither or neither. Um, then we'll do the British. Uh, we'll do the blitz phase now. Right. And then the blitz phase. I kind of already moved this unit preemptively, but, you know, the blitz phase, you would have deployed that unit to Oran. And then, um, oh, and so then for the blitz phase, I actually start, I do this battle again. I do this battle again, um, uh, Algiers. Let the uh, French roll, they roll a one. It's not going to do anything against the Americans who've already landed. The Americans roll, and they score plenty of twos and ones. So this French unit will be, will automatically surrender to the American landing. And so because of that, we've taken Algiers, we've taken another naval base. This was the primary naval base for the French, uh, pretty much what was left of the French Navy um, after the Battle of France. Um, so, you know, the, the 
the uh, the French just lost lost you know one one of their two major naval bases that they had. I think the other one would have been Tunis, right? Um, so the Allies now control Algiers. They also now control this Western Mediterranean Sea as well, or this part of the Western Mediterranean Sea, and that's a, that's a big game changer, right? Um, and then we'll do the British attack here at Oran. The British are up against um, a level zero French unit. And this militia unit, because it's level zero, will automatically surrender. There's no need for combat. And that's exactly what happens. So the Allies successfully invade French North Africa. We decide to bypass Casablanca, focus on Algeria, and it, and it paid off. So that's really good. Um, for the allies and so we deactivate this hq and then we're going to go ahead and do the uh, supply phase for this one uh, axis unit all the way out in casablanca its supply path right now is being cut off it would have been able to go via rail from casablanca through or oran through algiers and it would have continued all the way to like it probably would have stopped at algiers and then it would have continued via sea all the way up to somewhere like Mar uh, Marcel, and then move further north all the way to, say, Berlin, right? Uh, so that would have been like the normal supply path, which has been absolutely cut by the Allied landings. The other supply path we have is that we could do a supply path through the Atlantic Ocean. The problem is that the Atlantic Ocean is Allied-controlled, and the Allies can roll three dice to do that supply interdiction. And so if we look at the conditions... Um, for uh, regular sea supplies, it will that supply interdiction will occur if the if that die roll is a one, two, or a three. So our odds are pretty low um, because the Allies get to roll three three of those types of die to repulse three opportunities to repulse on a fifty percent chance Casablanca. And so I'm pretty sure if you do the math there, um, the odds are, I think are now a I think it was a twelve point five percent chance. If I did my math right there, it may even be lower than that. But I believe it's I believe it's a one in eighth chance that our supplies can make it through the Atlantic Ocean and then and then and then go through the Bay of Biscay, which is being controlled by this um, German controlled naval base of Brest. Or Brest. Um, the Allies score a one, three, and a two. They they completely repulse the supply path. No supplies can get to Casablanca, meaning that this unit is out of supplies. Um, then the last thing that we do, the last die roll that we do, this, this two that you see up here, um, that die roll is going to be the one that we actually do to check for uh, the surrendering, right? We, we, we're, check, we're checking the political phase, and we're just basically checking to see if that nation has surrendered. And so since the Allies control two naval bases, or, or excuse me, two, uh, two naval ports, or just simply two ports in... Um, in French North Africa, if they roll a one or a two, their 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 wariness value is a two. So if they score um, equal or less than that war wariness, all of French North Africa will surrender, and that's exactly what ends up happening. Um, we roll a two, and French North Africa, or Vichy France, all of Vichy France basically surrenders, and so that means that all the French units are eliminated from the board. They all disappear. There won't be a, a change in control of territory, but there will now be just vacant space that the uh, Third Reich's ground forces are going to have to occupy in order to stop the Allies from taking more territory. So uh, more units uh, surrender. And not only that, but I think this revolt unit actually joins the, uh, the, uh, the Allies. So um, here it is. Uh, we got to go back to those uh, war and peace rules, right? And just read up on what happens when a nation surrenders. And uh, let's look at that. Um, so we talked about demoralization. Uh, the nation has now surrendered. Vichy France has surrendered. And here are the surrender effects. Um, there is no change in control of territory. Um, but then you know, the nation's defeated. And then one national unit not in a hex containing German or foreign Axis units, uh, basically not near any German units, is replaced by a one CV national volunteer. And so what we decided to do is to convert one of the French units in Bicerte and convert it to uh, and uh, and convert it to uh, 
to uh, this uh, this volunteer. And what's amazing is that now the Allies, in theory, control like not one but two of the French North African naval bases, including Tunisia. And and if you know anything about Tunisia, the Tunisian campaign was a very critical campaign. It was one of the longer campaigns in North Africa, but it was where the Axis essentially built their final defense of North Africa as the uh, as the Allies pushed from the west, and they were also pushing from the east across to uh, across Libya. This was where the Axis set up their final defense. Um, now, where it stands right now is that basically uh, this, uh, because of the speed of the collapse of the French government, the Vichy French government specifically, now the the uh, the Allies are po- possibly in a position to even take Tunisia without even firing a single shot. So that is bad news for the Axis, right? And then I also go ahead and show you just the zone of control that is currently occurring. And you can see that, you know, each of these three units have a zone of control. Um, So, you know, all the other units, all the other areas rather are still technically um, German controlled or Axis controlled. But um, Tunis right now is not currently Axis controlled. That's a that's very bad news for the Axis. That is the major that is the major naval base that the Axis could use to bring up more reinforcements into North Africa, second to only uh, Tripoli itself. And now it is uh, allied controlled. So and then not only that, they also control um, three bodies of water because of the naval bases, right? Gibraltar controls the Albaran Sea. um, Algiers controls the Western Mediterranean. And now Tunis controls the uh, Tyrrhenian Sea. So uh, definitely a big uh, expansion in the allied sphere of influence right now, um, especially from a territorial perspective. So that was a big, big win for the allies, and it took the Axis completely off guard. So what I go ahead and do is I um, essentially activate OKW, and then I'll go ahead and and switch back to them, um, switch back to the Axis so that... um, Yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. And what basically happens is that now, as for the Axis turn on the Western Front, since the Allies had the initiative, I try to figure out, like, what can I do to bring up reinforcements? And so it was a tough move. It was a tough call. But um, after making a bunch of different adjustments, what I end up essentially doing, I was trying to figure out, like, what's the best combination? It was really hard. Um, But I think I finally figured out something that would work. I was trying to see if I could get this Panzer Corps moving all the way from northern France, doing three supreme moves, trying to move it to Sicily. It ended up being logistically too costly. So what I end up doing is that I move, I do move, um, yeah, I move a couple of these units from Paris to uh, fill in the gaps here in northern France, northwestern France, western France mostly. And then all these units that have this little E, E for expeditionary, I'm basically trying to deploy them to the south. And so I move this 90th Army, I basically put it in Marcel to protect that major naval base there. And then, what was the other move I did? I move another militia unit, I think I canceled that move, yep. I go ahead and actually I move this uh, German HQ, the only one other than OKW that was at full strength, and I move it with three supreme moves to all the way to Palermo. So I do, that's three strategic moves, plus another one there, plus another one here, plus another one there. And uh, I guess that was one, two, three, four, five, six. I may have actually done too many supreme moves for for the Germans. I may have done one extra. Um, oopsie daisies. So, um, yeah, that was that was essentially it. Now, I probably could make an adjustment here. Since technically I'm seeing that we did one supreme move there, two, three. This one was three, four, five, six, and then there's seven. So I may actually make that adjustment for later on because I don't think it would be fair for the allies if I left that there. Um, Yeah. So actually, I think that's what I'm going to do real quick here. is uh i think i'll do it at the probably at the end of this entire turn sequence um so yeah so i decided to move this italian unit um it it is it's going to have it's going to require some sort of naval maintenance 
and I just realized I forgot to do acclimatization as well. Holy moly, I, I, I did some mistakes there with the axes. Um, so anyways, yeah. Uh, the allies, their move after the axes move. Uh, maybe I should go back a little bit. Because that basically these last few moves that I was doing, uh, they basically end the, uh, yeah, they basically end the first fortnight of October, and then we move on to the next fortnight. And for the next fortnight, I do my quick die roll on the Eastern Front to check for the weather. It ends up being odd. So it's an odd number. So it's mud on the Eastern Front, right? And I can just update that with this marker there. And then I go ahead and do an axis move anyway. So I decide to activate Army Group A. Since the Soviets pulled out, I decide, you know, even though this HQ is disrupted, it still is going to have a command range of 1, right? 2 minus 1 is 1. And then I go ahead and just move all these units by just 1, across 1 hex, and just have them move up a little bit, you know. Yeah, I essentially have them move up a little bit with the idea of putting them in closer range to the Soviets we can we can possibly dig in for the coming winter um, and at least hold the line, uh, maybe be able to attack, maybe take make make advances or not. Either way, the the overall theme here is we're making slight progress with the Axis forces there. And then I think, yeah, I, I do switch back to the Allies. And then I try to figure out what the Allies are going to do on the Western Front, since they still have the initiative on the second Fortnite. And I think what I end up doing is I, try, I wanted to get a unit, I wanted to get this French unit into Tunis as soon as possible and fortify it and wait for more Allied reinforcements to come in. So what I end up doing is I activate this uh, uh, Mediterranean Theater HQ, right, which has a limited range, and I move it, the French unit there by one. And then I think I also, I think that was the only move I did for the uh, for the British and the Americans. So yeah, and I decided to to forego activating this Supreme HQ, which which could have only moved up one unit, and that one unit would have had to have been this American unit. I could have moved it via C to Bizerte, but then that would have left this port vulnerable to a German counteroffensive. Right, uh, some sort of uh, long-range amphibious invasion, and if the Germans were to do something like that and succeed, we would lose Algiers, and then our supply situation would be once again in bad shape. So I figured, let's hold on to this port, um, and, and let the French just defend on their own. So that's that. Um, the last move to really point out: deactivate those HQs. I go ahead and I activate OKW one last time. Even though it's at level two, I decided to activate it anyways, and I transferred its four supreme moves over to the Mediterranean front. And the two moves I do, one of them is to pull back this HQ back to Tobruk so that it would actually um, be easier to build up on the next turn. And then I decide to attack with this Italian unit to Tunis, um, and it actually would have combat support with this German HQ, which was in range. And I marked it as an invasion HQ, so it has range across the sea. It's two hexes away, and so that way we can actually provide some combat support there. And I did the battle. Um, the uh, the Italians didn't actually succeed, um, but uh, the French also scored no hits. The the first two die roll where it was the airstrike, it scored a half a hit. Um, one hit by the French was a miss. The Italians roll four. But technically, they should have only rolled two because this unit needs to undergo acclimatization. So that's what I'm going to do pretty much at the end of this turn. This is where the log file essentially ended. And I'm going to reduce this unit by two. Since, since the moment that it moved from Sicily to Tunis, it should have suffered acclimatization. And then uh, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to undo some of the uh, German moves so that they don't have any extra supreme moves, right? Um, so it's six supreme moves on the first four night. Uh, so I canceled two more. Oh, no, hold on. 
I think I have that confused, right? Yeah, because this this 90th core was or originally in Khan. So I'm going to return that unit. So that means that that leaves me with just one supreme move left right now. And I think the only other move I would do then is just move this unit via rail to uh, somewhere like Marcel. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So, yeah, not not a not an ideal situation at all for the uh, for the Axis right now. If we if we can't if we can't retake Tunis, um, we're we're in pretty bad shape. But the good news is that at least we have it contested, and um, hopefully we can bring up more reinforcements into uh, into the area. That's the idea. We gotta we gotta start transferring reinforcements into Tunisia, and the only port right now that would be under um, access control is the port of Sfax. The other two ports, Bizerte and Tunis, are currently Allied control, and we would have to do it before the Allies get there, which frankly is doubtful at this moment. Um, but we'll see. We'll see if we can pull it off. If not, then that's that, and we, we've lost Tunisia, and now we're gonna have to start like protecting Libya. And we're going to have to push on Alexandria really hard before we end up maybe losing that area as well. So it's not a good situation for the Axis right now in North Africa. We may have to abandon North Africa very soon. Um, so that is the log file for the month of October 1942. I'm going to go ahead and save this before I forget. And we're going to just leave it as it is, as, as it stands right now. And so that is the video. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see y'all in the next one. Peace out.